I could just keep worshiping. I would rather just keep worshiping right now. But um, we're going to spend our last portion together, and we are going to gaze at another Mary in this session. Um, we're going to gaze at Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the, I, I think about the Mary moments in the New Testament and how each of the Mary moments, they point to Jesus each and every time. In her song, her Magnificent, that she sang, praising and, 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 and glorifying him, it pointed to Jesus. She said, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Even then, Mary, as Jesus was in her, her womb, claimed him as her personal Savior. We see her encounter with Jesus in the temple, her intervention, intervention at the wedding of Cana, and her standing at the cross. And it all led back to Jesus, his mission, and him as Savior. So let's turn to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to just read verses 30 through 38, and then we're going to stop. Then the angel said to her, and we all know the story, we all know it, it's just so precious to read each and every time, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and, we, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I don't even know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And verse 38, this is the verse that we're going to just camp on in this last session. Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, do to me according to your word. Wow, let's look at this one statement. This one statement defines Mary's heart and it defines Mary's life. For behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Different Bible versions read this way. The New American Standard reads, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. The King James reads, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. These words, ladies, are words of sweet surrender. Oh, to fall at the feet of Jesus in utter wonder and submission to all that he is calling you and I to do in this life of ministry. This was Mary's response to God and to her response to his unmerited favor when she found out that she was chosen to carry the savior of the world. Behold means to fix the eyes upon, to see with attention, to observe with care. And the handmaiden means a female slave, a bond slave. Observe, she's saying, with care, fix your eyes. I am your bond slave. Do to me according to whatever you want, Lord. She was yielded. She was committed to her Savior, knowing fully and trusting fully that he had her best interests at heart and he had chosen her for a special call. And you know what? I think about that for you and I. He has our best interests in heart 
and he has chosen us for a special call on our life. And I don't know about you, but that, that really overwhelms me sometimes, that he would choose me, this person, to, to be used to glorify him. We discover the following from Mary's commitment of love, and that's what I call it, a commitment to the Lord of love. I loved that Terry was saying that this responding back in love to the Savior, you can't help but to respond back to loving him. But we see, I see four different things in this one proclamation, this one commitment of love. I see that Mary's life and her reason for existing was to be a witness to the glory of her Savior. I also see that she was a willing servant who trusted God and obeyed his call. I see that she was surrendered according to his word. And lastly, she was a humble servant. She was a bond slave. She said, I will be the slave. I will be your slave. Do to me according to whatever you want. She was yielded, surrendered, relinquished of all her will, and she reflected a heart and a life of obedience and worship to her God. She was a woman willing to obey and willing to be yielded. And I asked myself this question, is my life a witness to the glory of my Savior? And I fall short at times with that, but that's what I want to be. Let me ask you, we must ask ourselves this question, is there anything in my heart or in my life that is not bringing glory to Jesus? I find as I walk with the Lord longer, I find I need more work. You would think it'd be the opposite. I'm walking with the Lord all these years and I, you know, you would think that you would, but I find when I'm before him, I see the things that I feel like, oh, I need so much work in this area, Lord. Do we glorify our Savior in our homes and, and the way we submit to our husbands? Do we glorify him in our church? Maybe by the way we even dress, our attire, maybe by the way we speak, and maybe by the way we serve. These are all very important things to bring before God as women who serve his people. We need to surrender anything anything that might be unpleasing to God's heart, anything that doesn't bring him glory. I don't know about you, but I think about the fact I don't ever want to break his heart. I love him so much. I just don't want to break his heart because he loves me so much. And so I'm constantly asking myself these questions. And Kay, Pastor Chuck's wife Kay, she has taught us that there is nothing more precious than to please the heart of Jesus in a woman's life. There's nothing more precious than to see a woman who desires to please the heart of Jesus. Nothing more precious, and I don't know about you, but I truly, with all my being, want to please his heart. And I do fall short, but my heart is to obey him. We must think of God first and live with his pleasure uppermost in our mind. When we do that, it's easy to fall back on what pleases him. We must be a witness to those in our congregations of the glory of our Savior. You know, the woman looked to us. You know, we may be the only godly woman in their life. They may be young girls who just got saved. I mean, we've had a few young girls come through our church, 15, 16 years old. They just got saved. They don't have anyone in their family, anyone in their life that they, they can look to, to to just see what a godly example would be. And they're looking to us. I know when I first got saved, I got saved and then the Lord called Phil into the ministry. So not only was I saved, but I was now a pastor's wife and I didn't have anyone around me to look to. And I know that the Lord will show us and he will teach us just one-on-one -on -one, and he does that. But it's so good to know that young women could look to us as a godly example as we glorify our Savior. I always say that Kay Smith 
doesn't know how much like I love her and she's been my mentor and she's like my best friend but she doesn't know it <laughs> because she was in California and I was here in Illinois but when I got saved I'm like Lord I don't know how to be I just I want to be like you and a lot of what the Lord taught me I learned one-on-one -on -one with him but it was Kay that I kind of glanced at through her teachings I got all her teachings, and I just, I just absorbed myself. And what, what, what does a godly woman look like? What does a pastor's wife look like? So these young women, and even older women, are coming into our churches. They need to see women who are godly examples. So Mary also, she was willing. She was a willing servant, and she trusted God and <laughs> obeyed God. Are you a willing servant? Do you trust him? Do you trust him with your burdens, your problems, your prodigals? Do you trust him with your husband, your children, your grandchildren? Do you trust him with your finances, your churches, the people in your churches? Don't you sometimes, as a pastor's wife, don't you get so burdened for some of the problems you know that that you know that come your way and the women that come to you and they they're hurting and they're and it can it can burden you ladies we need to be like Mary and say behold the handmaiden of the Lord do to me according to your word Lord surrender we need to be fully surrendered and willing to trust God that he will meet the needs of all those that come our way do you trust him are you willing? Are you willing to obey that the Lord is calling you into the ministry? You know, maybe just maybe ministry life was something you never really wanted. I mean, it was the farthest thing from your mind. I know it was for Phil and I. I mean, before we got saved, we had all other ideas that we were going to have and do. Um, it was the farthest thing from what we actually wanted to do until we surrendered our heart to him and realized there was nothing better in this world to do but to serve him. But maybe you had desired a career, whatever that may be, or maybe not a career, maybe something else in your life, and you thought, how did this happen? I am now a pastor's wife. I am now an assistant pastor's wife. How does this, how does this happen? Ministry is the richest, most important work this side of heaven and can I exhort you to be like Mary just be a willing servant just obey the call don't look back don't look back at what you thought you were going to do but stay steady and be willing to serve and obey the call on your life you know I have prayed over this message, and I have been wanting to go in different ways, in different ways with this message. And God kept calling me back to this. We need to be surrendered to the fact that we are called to the ministries because of our husband and that our husband is our first ministry. He is calling you to be the wife that your husband needs. That is what he's calling you to do. And when you are the wife that God wants you to be to him, he will bless every area of your life. He will bless whatever ministry you touch, whatever woman you, you give you know, biblical counsel to. He will bless your prayers. He will bless your marriage. When you are the wife God has called you to be, you will be blessed. You know, in Genesis 2, 18, it says that the the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. The word helper means helpmeet. It is to complete him. We are to complete our husbands. And it goes on in Genesis 2, 23 and 24. It says that Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Ladies, 
We are to be one with our husbands. We are to be their helpmeets, their helpers, their source of encouragement, their, their means to ease in the work and in the ministry that they are called to do. You may be single here. Please listen, because you may not be single the rest of your days. God may bring that godly man into your life, and you're going to find yourself married. And God wants you to make him your first ministry. Our intended role by God is to be a helper, one called alongside to help our husbands. We are to be his helper and to make his life easier. I have said this before, we are to complete him, not to compete with him. We are there to just align our hearts with his as his is aligned with God's heart. So I'm going to ask you six questions, and you might want to jot these down because then you can go before the Lord with them. And I, you know, I will go in a little detail on each after I list them, um, but I don't want to spend tons of time. But this is where God has left me. I'm like, Lord, we're talking about surrender. And the Lord spoke to me. He's like, how can we as women of God surrender if we are not surrendered to our husband? First, to the call of God and then to the, our husbands. So the first question is, how can I best compliment my husband? How can I best compliment him? Is my desire for my husband only? Do I respect my husband? Even when you don't agree with maybe a way he wants to go in the ministry or within the family or you know you may not agree but but do you respect him do you submit to your husband do I submit to my husband <coughs> do I pray daily for my husband and lastly Am I developing a love and dependence upon God? When your walk is rich and willing and surrendered, your husband will be blessed. So how can I best compliment my husband? What do I mean by this? What can I do? What, what do I mean by this? I ask myself pretty much daily, what can I do today? to meet one of his most pressing needs. Sometimes I can't. You know, those pressing needs may be the burden of people in the church that he is praying over. You know, some, but sometimes I can, and I ask him, what can I do for you today, honey, that'll make your life easier? Can I run to the store? Can I pick up something for ministry? What, what would you like? What kind of dinner would you like? Whatever that is. It might be as small as, you know, maybe he hasn't even had time to call his mom call his mom for for him pick up, if, if his mom is still alive you know there's nothing sweeter to a man than his mom and we need to love our husband's mom and I know that could be difficult sometimes but when you love his mom he loves you in return it's so important. You know, the world is always putting down the whole mother-in-law thing, you know, which I don't understand. I loved my mother-in-law, even before we were saved, you know. I just knew how much my husband loved her, and I knew that that meant a lot to him. So it could be as small as picking up the phone and calling her for him, or as big as making sure that the children are cared for, the house is cleaned, the dinner is cooked, the makeup is on before he walks in the door. It's important. And I know when you have little ones, it's hard. But even when my kids were little, and Phil worked two jobs, and he was going to college, and he was working in the ministry. But when I knew he was heading home, the kids, we would straighten up the house, things would be in order, the dinner would be cooked, and I would... I would pro sometimes be in my pajamas from the morning. I never even got in the shower. And I would make sure that I'd get my makeup on and look pretty for him. Because I didn't, I just wanted to bless his heart. 
So that's what I mean by how can I best compliment him? The next is, is my desire for my husband only? Do I have eyes for my husband only? That's so important to have just eyes for him and only him. <laughs> because sometimes we will, things will come our way on TV or maybe magazines we pick up and read. You know, and Satan uses that stuff. We need to be careful, especially as women in lead leadership. You know, we have higher calling, ladies, than most Christian ladies do. They shouldn't be looking at that either, but I'm just saying, they, we have a higher, higher accountability. The world says that we should be able to keep our guy friends after we're married. No. No guy friends in, involved. No. You want to know why? A friend is defined as this. And with Facebook, a lot of times, you know, you, you, you know, someone will show up from your past, you know. And I tell women all the time, don't go there. You need to have your eyes only for your husband. And they'll say to me, but they are. And I give them this definition of a friend. A friend is defi defined as this, one attached to another by affection or esteem, a favored companion. You know, my best friend, apart from Jesus, is my husband, Phil. That's my best friend. As a, a male, Matt, he is my best friend. Never, ever share your heart with another man other than your husband. You need to be totally eyes only for him. This keeps us walking strong with the Lord. It keeps Satan from having his way or having a foothold in our lives. Our eyes and hearts should only be for our husbands. And I know that we know this. I know that you know this. I, I may just be affirming what you know, but I feel like the Lord wants us in these last days to be so careful, so careful. Do I submit and respect my husband? I always say this. Do you realize that the Bible doesn't say, wives, Respect your husbands when they give you a reason that you think is suitable to win their respect. It doesn't say that. It just doesn't. It just says simply, we must respect our husbands. If you feel like you don't have anything to respect him for, ask God to reveal to you one thing that you can respect him for. Respect is defined as this, an act of giving particular attention or consideration, high or special regard. Men need to be respected. They don't get respect a lot of times. Sometimes the people in our congregations can be disrespectful in the way they treat our husbands and talk to our husbands, and leaders can be disrespectful to our, our very own husbands. But so they shouldn't have to come home and, and have disrespect in the home, right? We need to just keep that in mind. It's to regard highly, to esteem. Do you give particular attention to your husband, his needs, his desires, his worries, and his fears? Encourage him with your words and with scriptures. You know, I don't know if I shared this before, but as the kids were growing up, we had the red plate. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It was like kind of an older thing. But it's a, it's a red plate, and on it, it says, you are special. It's just written on there. And on the back, you can write the different occasions and stuff. And when my husband would be particularly discouraged in ministry, or, you know, just discouraged, because, you know, I, a lot of your husbands never get discouraged. They're always happy. They're always courageous. They're always going, that's not my husband. My husband just is, a, he's a real sensitive, emotional heart. And things get to him, and the burdens of the people get to him, and he gets discouraged. And when he does, I pray, God, how can I encourage him? What can I do? And a lot of times, we put the red plate out. We would get together, we would clean up, we'd make his favorite dinner, his favorite dessert, and then one by one, we would say why we loved him that night just a small thing. You may have other ideas, but your husband needs your encouragement. 
I have a high regard for him and his feelings and his needs. Because, you know, we live with him, right? So we kind of, we're not sometimes as careful to see what does he need? What, what, what is it that is bothering him? Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but the interests of others. Does your husband's heart safely trust in you, like Proverbs 31? We simply, ladies, need to just die to self, putting his needs first. Now, the world <laughs> would say to me, are you crazy? You need to put your needs first. You know, what, what do you think? You know, you're, you do a lot. You know, like I work full time. I, I hear the girls at my workplace, you know. Well, I work full time and, you know, he better get his act together and get this done. And it's like, no, that's not what the word of God says. Phil helps me because I work full time, but I don't expect that help because he's got a weightier call than my career at work, which is not a career that I want. I'm just there because God has me there right now, you know? Do you pray for your husband daily? I love Vi's prayer book. It's for children, but you can use it for your husbands. And I got a little catch of wind that she might be journaling one for husbands. Maybe, right? This year. This year. So, you know, I have always prayed Colossians 4.17 for my husband, that he would take heed of the ministry that he received in the Lord, that he will fulfill it, that he will not stop short of one day of what God has for him. I always pray 1 John 2.16 for him, that he would never, ever, ever fall to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those three things. I have prayed Deuteronomy 32 when he gets into the pulpit and I'm sitting there in the congregation and I will pray, oh Lord, let his teaching drop as the rain and his speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on tender grass, Lord, as showers on the grass. Let him proclaim your name, Lord, and may he ascribe greatness to you. Take the scriptures, pray daily for your husband. He needs that. Are you developing a dependence upon God? Are you surrendered? Ladies, obedience is born out of brokenness. Like Mary, she was willing to be whatever was according to God's word. Obedience is born out of brokenness, and brokenness is born out of surrender. So in order for you and I to be obedient to the Lord and to his word, we must first be broken, then yielded, then surrendered. I just think that the last thing our church needs is a pastor's wife that is not surrendered to the Lord, right? I mean, we, we wouldn't want that. We want our people to see a pastor's wife to fully surrender to the Lord and to what he has. Terry mentioned the book, Calvary Road. It is like one of my favorites. And I'm going to quote a couple quotes from there. In the Calvary Road, uh, Roy Hessian says this, It is always self who gets irritable and envious and resentful and critical and worried. It is self who is hard and unyielding in its attitude toward others. It is self who is shy and self-conscious and reserved. No wonder we need breaking. As long as self is in control, God can do little with us. Also, in the Calvary Road, it says, Dying to self is not a thing we do once for all. It's not just a one-time deal. There may be an initial dying when God first shows things, but ever after, it will be a constant dying. For only so can the Lord Jesus be revealed constantly through us. He goes on to say, All day long, the choice will be before us in a thousand ways. It will mean no plans, no time, no money, no pleasure of our own. It will mean a constant yielding to those around us. For our yieldness to God is measured by our yieldness to men. And I, that's why I felt like the Lord was linking the surrender with our husband too. It's so important that we are one with our husband in the ministry. It can't be a divided hearts. We must be one. 
He is calling us. God is calling us to relinquish all to him. Relinquish all of ourselves, not just bits and pieces, but all of ourselves unto him. Like Terry mentioned about Mary with the alabaster jar, and she broke it, and she just didn't pour a little dab and just hold the rest back. She poured it all out. And that's what we need to do as pastor's wives, assistant pastor's wives, in women's ministry. We need to pour all of ourselves, relinquish everything to him. No holding back. What is it that you find hard to relinquish unto him? Andrew Murray says this. He says, just as a servant knows that he must first obey his master in all things, so the surrender to an implicit and unquestionable obedience must become the essential characteristic of our lives. Calvary Road, Roy Hessian says, brokenness in daily experience is simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. And inasmuch as this conviction is continuous, we shall need to be broken continually. And this can be very costly. When we see all the yielding of rights and self-interest that this will involve and the confessions and restitutions that may be necessary. You know, ladies, brokenness can only happen when we are humbled before our Savior. When we realize how great he is in light of how small we are. How holy he is in light of how sinful we are. He's calling us to be like Mary. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. I'm your bond slave, Lord. Do with me according to your word. Humble is defined as not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive, reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of deference or submission. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 says, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. May it be your clothing. How, do, how, do we, how are we clothed? By spending time in the presence of our Savior. The longer, again, I walk with the Lord, the more I see the, his greatness in light of my weakness, his holiness in light of my sin, and it causes me to break in front of him because I want to be all that he's calling me to be. Again, I fall short, but I don't know about you, but I want to be all surrendered, not just bits and pieces, all surrendered. The longer I serve him in ministry, the more I see my constant need to walk in humility before God and before man. Oh, it's so important. You know, it's, it's been said about humility, and I love this quote. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. We decrease. He increases. You see, the ministry has no room for those who put self above the will of God and others. It just has no place. God cannot bless it. He will not bless it because he will not stand in a place where he doesn't receive the glory because he deserves the glory. We must keep our hearts broken always before the Lord. I want to close with this the lyrics from the song that was taken during the Welsh revival, which I thought was so neat that Terry and Vi were sharing about Mr. Willis being saved in the Welsh revival, and the Lord gave me this very song. So listen to how, when revival is taking place, ladies, this is what the tone is. This is what the people were singing out their hearts were contrite, and these were the songs. The song was off the lips of God's people. It says, Lower and lower, dear Lord, at thy feet, seeking thy spirit, thy mercy so sweet. Down in our need, blessed Master, we fall. Lower and lower be thou all in all. Lower and lower, down at thy cross, all the world's treasure, counting but dross. Down at thy feet, blessed Savior, we fall. 
Lower, still lower, lower, Christ all in all. Lower and lower, dear Savior, we pray, losing the self-life still more every day. Weak and unworthy, we're looking above. Empty us wholly, then fill us with love. Lower and lower, yet higher we rise. Lifted in Christ, free from the earth ties. Humbly, we follow the way of the cross. Then crowns of glory and gain for all loss. May we, like Mary, hold up our hands in sweet surrender and say to the Lord, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, do to me according to thy word. My prodigal, he's yours. My finances, they're yours. The congregation, yours. My children, yours. Grandchildren, parents, all his in sweet surrender. It is the best place to lay your burdens down. Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, do to me according to thy word. Amen. Amen. Father, we do want to be women surrendered to you. Surrendered to the call on our lives, Lord, and surrendered, Lord, in every area of our lives. Where we're not holding back bits and pieces, but that whatever your lot is for us, we are willing and to be a bond slave to it, to you and to the to whatever you've called us to be, Lord. Lord, I love you and I praise you. And as we move into this time of communion, I pray that your presence fall on this place, Lord, and that you would be glorified in this time of breaking of bread. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you made a way for us, Lord. And now we just want to give you gratitude and love and adoration for using us, Lord, for your glory. And Father, I pray that each one here is just encouraged and, and, and built up, Lord, and used in a mighty way this coming year. Father, we pray for our men. Oh, how we thank you for them, Lord. Would you, Lord, just surround them with your peace with your goodness and your mercy and your protection. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to their side. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And in just in closing, I'm going to give you this scripture. And it's out of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory and exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.